Sing in a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths. So when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable senior network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com at Revolution Radio. Our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hala Cass, MD, Melanie Richman, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trallo, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, DODDS, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. If uh, you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. And that's right here, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you had Come on. Trouble. I'm sorry you had starving. Trouble. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, and above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds, 25 years in the freezer, long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy, the shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need, as humans, to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the mega courts to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents on the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So stay tuned to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. Now it's time for Researchers Radio Live, broadcasting worldwide with your hosts, Joe Kiernan and Dave Stanett. Our focus is on delivering the unknown truths about lost historical events, UFOs, and so much more. If you were expecting to be underwhelmed, then you have been listening to your parents' radio a bit too long. This is where facts get separated from conspiracies. So turn up your volume and join us on our journey into the universal mind, where experience, thoughts, and ideas meet the infinite. So stop wandering around in darkness and follow us into the light. Without further delay, here is tonight's program of Researchers Radio Live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to freedomslips.com. This is Researchers Radio Live. I am Joe K. We are also joined by my main man, Tim C. How are you, Tim C.? Doing good, Joe. Glad to be back. Missed you guys Very last nice week. nice to have you back. The world just hasn't quite been the same. Yes. I, uh, unfortunately, I lost a very dear friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I, my thoughts and prayers go out to his family and, and friends. And, um, you know, I just... Very rough week, but, you know, it's good to be back. I'm very happy to have you back, buddy. 
we all are. So um, we got a big night tonight, mm-hmm. as is every Sunday night at this time. Uh, we got a cool month. We have uh, a few really good guests. Our main man, Robert Sullivan, is coming back in two weeks on the 21st for the autumn equinox. Very important day. And um, tonight we're going to be focusing on, I guess I've kind of been preparing for this. Actually, last week, Tim, I was able to play a little bit of uh, the readings of the letters of Marsilio Ficino. And uh, we have a month that we're next month. Next week we have, we're going to be talking about, who do we have next week, Tim? Is that Bruno? Yep, Giordano Bruno's next week, followed by John D. And then Rene Descartes, the last week, uh, three masters of the early days. And um, they are all geniuses in their own right. And I didn't mean to leave out. There's a few others along the way that we're skipping over. But uh, these three are important because they all directly stem from Marsilio Ficino. And uh, there, there's a lot of reasons for that. And even many, many other scholars... Uh, even up till today, can trace all of their uh, learned knowledge, the knowledge in which they seek personally, back to Marsilio Ficino. And there, there is good probable reason for all of it. Um, there are others of his time who were also very influential. However, uh, it cannot be argued that Marsilio Ficino was definitely one of the most influential people to even bring about what is known as the Renaissance. Uh, Every master uh, thinker, writer, and artist of the time, if they did not know Marsilio Ficino, they were definitely aware of his teachings uh, on a daily basis. Um, Marsilio Ficino lived from 1433 to 1499, He primarily worked solely for the Medici family. He was initially, uh, initially his uh, first patron was Cosimo de' Medici, who was a very important person in the 1400s. And um, he worked for them specifically, translating uh, old books that Lorenzo de' Medici and King Matthias were, they were feverish, they were, Tim, they were acquiring every book they could uh, because this was right after Constantinople fell. And they had people literally um, going to different harbors and uh, different towns where everyone was going. And um, there's even a lot of letters that exist from uh, booksellers and uh, and people of the likes that were writing letters to uh, Lorenzo de' Medici and King Matthias. Uh, letting the them mad rush. Fight, right. I mean, even letters from Rome to King Matthias in Hungary. Uh, because they knew they were seeking out all the old books uh, in the fall of Constantinople. And because uh, Constantine had a fantastic library, not to mention just many other scholars that were there. And uh, we have to remember, this was known as the center of the world, Constantinople, for all learning for 1,500 years straight up until the fall of it. So a, a lot of old wisdom came out of Constantinople. Isn't it, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, sometimes I think this fact might actually be untrue or, or inaccurate, but um, history will tell you that, you know, at, at that time, uh, the medieval world kind of lost the esoteric hermetic teachings. But right. when I say that, I'm referring to Europe, Eastern Europe. Well, uh, well... It was definitely a part of the the Byzantium kingdom, right. not necessarily the the city of Constantinople. There were there were many different. You know, for fifteen hundred years, we've spoke before Tim, uh, Christians, pagans, uh, the, the Khazars, uh, there were many Arabs and Muslims, uh, Muslims rather. Uh, there was, uh, they, they all lived in Constantinople relatively fine. Uh, there there really was not much strife in Constantinople. Uh, it was the Western Roman Empire that had the Dark Ages. There was no Dark Ages in the Eastern Roman Empire. I mean, they they were striving. That was the center of all trade. Constantinople is still the uh, Istanbul now, but still the only city in the world that is on two continents. 
Uh, right. Because what people fail to remember is on one side of Constantinople, you enter into Turkey. Uh, up until modern time, that was considered Asia right there. That's where yep. Asia began. So, uh, you know, King, King Matthias in Hungary, you know, there was the book written in his time uh, documenting his life. And he was a direct descendant from Attila the Hun, thus Hungary, meaning of the Hun. Um, they, they were very proud of that. And uh, King Matthias is obviously one of the uh, people out of the, the, the scholars and, and enlightened and the nobles from the Eastern Roman Empire. You know, we have to remember they were larger than the Western Roman Empire in person count. Uh, that quickly diminished with the witch hunts and the incredible inquisitions that ran strong for sure. a couple hundred years there. Uh, but nonetheless, there were people like Lorenzo and King Matthias that were collecting the wisdom and had the means financially, but also the desire to acquire this knowledge and also acquire all the geniuses from those that area to not only translate them, but to teach them and and live with them. And uh, like in uh, Ficino's case, Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, Cosmo de' Medici, Lorenzo's grandfather, took on um, Marsilio Ficino and gave him a nice cottage home in Florence and, uh, you know, gave him uh, a salary so he could, you know, have whatever he needed. But his sole purpose was to translate old documents and texts and to teach the Medici children. And what people always forget is there's people like Giordano Bruno, more important, how about Galileo, you know, these were all people that their patrons were the Medici. They lived with the Medici, funded by the Medici, and more importantly, these were the teachers of the Medici. So, all, all for the most part, all of the scholars you're going to get out of the Renaissance were the people that were really bringing about change. You know, this was this was a great time of uh, a loss of knowledge. It was it was an incredible time of loss, and there were only a few people trying to hold on to it, and only a few people that could, because there are places like Venice and Florence that at that time, remember, these were independent kingdoms. They were not under Roman control. Uh, so, yeah, Venice was its own nation, you're right. Venice was its own nation, and you know, Venice's origins, when it was originally built, it, the translation is, that's the city of Venus. And Florence is Jerusalem of the West. And that's what it was known as in that time. In the Renaissance, that was known as Jerusalem of the West, people. That's why you will see no New Testament sculptures in Florence. And that's why you see the wonderful Michelangelo sculpture of David staring at Rome with a fierce determination look. He is staring directly at Rome. This was not, not a nice time. There was um, Inquisition was running strong. You know, they actually moved that statue a few times. Yeah, yeah. It was damaged a couple times, too. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. You know, um, it's you know, the funny thing about that sculpture. It really is an incredible piece of work. It's a little off topic, but when I saw it, you, when you stand underneath it, you see the size of his hand is just completely oversized for the rest well, of his body, but you well, can't tell. It was replaced, no? Well, no, I don't think so. I think that the I think from what I remember, uh, there was a break and they they fixed it more or less. But there was also uh, a time where um, one of the the buildings that was in the ceiling collapsed, something along those lines. I remember that. I almost want to say that the hand or arm was broken off, and and someone. This is the story that I'm recalling that a a younger guy picked up the broken, I'm going to say hand, picked up the hand, and he kept it for a decade or two till, uh, till peace came about. And uh, this guy uh, came to the Medici with the, with the hand, and, um, and they were grateful. And, uh, but he said, you know, but he wanted to be the guy to replace the hand and repair it. And I, if I'm correct about that story, this person would be, became to be known as Giorgio Vasari. Oh, so uh, he would have known about proportion. <laughs> well, if anybody can uh, corroborate that 
please feel free to give us a call or write something in the chat room. So, back to it, buddy. Right on. I don't want to spend all the time talking about Constantinople because it, it is what it is. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the, the mystery schools of Egypt were open. The, uh, the, the Ion Sophia was known as the nave of the world. And what else can I say about Constantinople? Oh, yeah. The doors to the Ion Sophia were made, by, uh, were made from Noah's Ark. Uh, hey, that's what they say. It's not me. Uh, but to them, the Ark was math. What's wrong, Joe? You don't believe that? Well, in the Eastern Roman Empire, they didn't believe Noah's Ark was a boat. They thought it was math. That's right. You know, and we'll get to that shortly on what yeah, may have been that one. to Ficino. So, Tim, you know why I like Ficino? I found out about Marsilia Ficino when I was looking into uh, uh, understanding Plato a little bit more. Because you, you, you could read it, and they, they are lengths of work. But nobody, nobody doubts the impressive qualities, you know, um, everybody gets, everyone learns something from Plato. You, you, you pick something up, everyone can relate to it. And, and what's always, what's, what's always really grateful. I'm always grateful about is it's, it's accepted. You know, when, if you try to explain something and you have to relate or quote to something of Plato or Socrates, it's usually kind of understood, you know, um, they had a better way of putting things and and for the right reason uh, they 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 wrote things down and they carved things in stone for great purpose of good design it wasn't just hey i'm just going to write this down there there were good reasons for it um i'm not going to say they didn't have any downtime but um their teachings were a little bit different what you know what i like about him is is uh that a lot of, most of his you know, quotes, we'll just say, really can stand the test of time because, I mean, you can apply them to politics, uh, you know, today's politics and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, how I, I tend to go off on politics and, right. and whatnot. But, you know, a lot of his stuff really does apply to modern day times. And that that is really rare when it comes, especially how ancient the writings are. Yeah, I was just reading something, man. It always, it always kills me with Plato when... Um, in the Timaeus, he's writing, it's Socrates is saying something, he's, he's complaining about the kids, like uh, the kids today is what he's saying. He's, <laughs> they, they don't listen to anything their parents tell them, they don't acknowledge um, guests when they enter a room, and you know, he's going your through. Pants, cut he's, your hair. It's, it's just like, wow, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, what he was saying is said today. Uh, it's, it's, it's just funny to hear someone like that say it. Yeah. But, you know, um, we have a few things to thank uh, Ficino for directly. Uh, indirectly, many great minds, many great ideas, m much great architecture, and the arts. And, but most importantly, what was most important to Ficino was teaching and understanding. Everything that we see in the Renaissance was just kind of a, um, a fallout of an understanding. There was a practice. Art was part of attaining the main goal. Just a fraction, just as Da Vinci or my main man, Albrecht Dürer, who these, these guys, especially Albrecht Dürer, knew Ficino really well. Um, but when they did art, when they did a painting, the painting itself, the whole painting, is a proper rectangle because it's a golden rectangle. It's a Pythagorean math, and it, it's broken down through sacred geometry, and that's how you could find each image in the pictures. Uh, it's known today. Uh, we wrote an article on that, Dr. Gardner and I. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art recently did something. Tim let me in on that. I appreciate that, Tim. You're welcome. Uh, it's what it was done, but it wasn't just the math and the art. It was they were using proper elements to make the paint. There were certain elements, as Ficino writes in his book on life, that would impose great qualities that would benefit your life if used and applied the proper way and used at the proper time, meaning when certain stars and planets are in certain places. So almost would, a ritualistic uh, way of performing, of 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 creating the art. And the truth is, you it, pointed it, this it out down to as, as above, so below. It was right. cer certain reasons under certain constellations, certain elements, and certain stones 
or serve a good purpose. Uh, you had mentioned in one of our a show a couple months back um, when we were discussing, you know, Renaissance art that sacred geometry really appeals to the eye. And um, if you look at, say, I mean, the most famous work of art, the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. that the proportions that are involved there um, are mathematically correct, are mathematically correct. Right. And, and therefore, they, they are naturally appeasing to your eye. Right. Just just as the the latest study out of Harvard, where they showed uh, there was 100 different people and they showed 100 different images and everyone was to rate them on from a one to 10 scale on if they thought the person was attractive and it was female and male just overall did an attractive person and as the study came out just as they figured the people that they voted for the most attractive were the people that their facial features were of equal proportion you know where sometimes your ears might be a little lower than your eyes or your nose might be a little wider than they should be just little variations um your the the more perfectly proportioned someone's face was the better they got uh, rated on appearance. And, and it goes with music, too. Absolutely. Well, you're out of tune. You know, the, the, as uh, many will tell you, uh, harmony is majorly important. Uh, our musical notes today are Pythagorean math. Uh, it's the music of the spheres. Um, heck, there's a, there's a book called The Music of the Spheres that's almost 2,000 years old. Uh, they, they knew about this then, and... Please, Tim, don't let me get into the world is flat thing here, because <laughs> because they were writing so many things about the world being around more than two thousand years ago. I can't even take it. Um, so directly with Ficino, influences we had with Plato, and I was trying to find. Uh, I wasn't looking for like a, a group to people of to like go and discuss Plato, but I wanted to discuss it on it. On, I, I knew it for what it was worth, but I knew there was more to it, right? And I heard a lot of other interpretations. Uh, a professor from Yale, I saw his seminar and a few others that are uh, quite reputable. And, you know, they had great points, you know, but they're all their own interpretations. You know, so, so I wanted to go back. You go back a little more, you know, because they, everything gets changed. So I, I go back to the beginning. Marsilio Ficino, that's it. There's, I cannot find anything else on Plato before Marsilio Ficino. There is, there is a partial text that exists, uh, but uh, no complete works. But there, there is one a little bit older, but not too much older. But, um, you know, they were all collected and burned up. And, um, and that story does exist. And uh, last week, what people didn't know was uh, I played a few letters, Tim, that Marsilio Ficino wrote. Uh, one in particular, it was, uh, he titles it a, a conversation between God and the soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful letter. It's just, it's, it's well written. And it gives, it gives a fantastic explanation on just basic understanding of maybe every day or where, where you are on this rock. And, and what is this thing? And may, you know what? Maybe you really have something to do here on Earth. Maybe you're not just supposed to work really hard for, for that car so everyone thinks you look really cool. Um, there are many different ways of looking at it. So I wanted to find my own interpretation. So you know me, Tim. Got to go to the horse's mouth. So going to Ficino, you find out, as, as through many other... Scholars of his time, um, the Inquisition really wanted a piece of him. And um, I, I didn't understand why, because he had books in print where if he had books in print, how would he live years longer if they were questionable prints? And some people say, well, he wrote very crush questionable works, very... Uh, Heretic works that should get you killed. And it's important to mention that he was a priest. <laughs> right. right. And, and people say he was, he was safe because he was under the Medici's protection. Um, 
No, he was a priest. Yeah. And there are many letters existing between him and cardinals above him and archbishops. Uh, there's much correspondence of him writing letters before he published certain books and after. So he would warn he would warn the the church, you know, before he would put something, you know, kind of a, a right. Well, they knew what he was. They they knew his teachings. You know, they they knew they knew who he was and who his beliefs were. Right. And he yes, he was a priest, no doubt about it, and a priest uh, for a long time. Um, however, he did not agree with Roman Catholic teachings. So he. He didn't teach anything. He wasn't a teaching priest, Tim. All right? He was a scholar priest. Um, he, was, he was protected from the Medici side, yes, and from a lot of connections in the church higher up than him that understood his genius and understood what he was teaching and, and, and did not consider it wrong at all, but were worried for him. And that's what a lot of the letters show. They, they were worried about them. So what I was getting at was the letter I showed, I played last week here about the conversation between God and the soul. I really wanted to play that because what people don't know is there's that letter exists only in one location. Obviously, it was a one single letter. And of that personal letter I chose to read because of its brilliance, that letter was snatched up 500 years ago, and the Vatican still owns it today. However, like I said, they are trying to digitalize their whole library, so things are coming out. So, why, 40 years. why would the Vatican snatch up such a wonderful letter from a priest? Interesting. Was it to keep it for safety, um, so it'll be preserved? Well... It was in a file for over 400 years that they called 400-year-old hidden garbage that somehow <laughs> should have gotten thrown away. Um, so it was, and it was in the time when a lot of his books did go away. Now, meow, if I could get to here. Uh, my boy Plato, dude, you know my love for Plato, even more so for his guy Socrates. I can make a platonic joke, but it's just corny. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you another one, another quick thing. Uh, you could also thank Facino for the expression pl platonic love, because he wrote the book called On Platonic Love. But now, Plato. Let's talk about Facino and Plato. So, Facino, Marsilio Facino, is the guy who gives us all Plato today. If you've ever read Plato, or heard anyone read anything of Plato or mention Socrates, surely it derives from his pen and his mind because he was a master of memory and the guy could, guy was a uh, guy knew quite a few languages. He was a scholar, no doubt. So, what is so important about Plato? Well, as it turned out for me, Tim, I go right back to the horse's mouth, Marsilio Ficino, and he writes many other things on Plato unknown to me. Um, interpretations, uh, he's, uh, orations, and, uh, and I get into you know, his, his commentaries on certain books and certain uh, teachings in Plato. And I say, well, that's interesting because I've just read 10 of his explanations and all 10, I've never heard anything close to before. And, uh, I mean, at anywhere. This is all out of left field. And I said, how could this guy be writing an interpretation of Plato so profoundly different than anything that exists to Plato today? How could this be? And in what, in what capacity? Well, we have Plato today, thanks to Marsilio Ficino, yes. But... The truth of the matter is Marsilio Ficino was writing the, the full works of Plato's teachings, but when it was done and after it was complete, two copies were made. One was a, a 
One copy went to Lorenzo de' Medici and his library, and King Matthias likewise. Now, both of these works were done by uh, illuminators, uh, by which I mean these are, you know, when, when we watch a movie and they show the Renaissance or medieval times and, and they show these beautiful colored papers, uh, pages with, with gold leafing and beautiful, glorious colors. Well, ridiculous detail with the bordering they come and all from that. Illuminators and right. and they 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 were miniaturists is what they were also known as because they were just working on masterpieces just on a small scale just on a piece of paper, and uh, I should come to what I was I met, forgot to mention just a minute ago Tim was when they made these paints uh, for these il illuminated books they did it just like let's say Albrechter did for his paintings, not only was their proportions and their math always proper, but they used the right elements at the right time. Uh, by, I mean, if they needed red, uh, if, if they needed red and uh, mercury was in a certain point, uh, well, you know, they needed to get Realgar, and which, is a, which is a red stone in the, in the mines in, in Europe, and they would grind up this stone and mix it in with an oil medium, and boom, that's your red. They weren't just uh, mixing in different pigments. When these artists from the Renaissance applied colors, these were pure elements. These were gemstones ground up. And these colors all had significant meaning. You could look it up, folks, that are not my words. All Renaissance artists, not only were their proportions mathematically correct, but they used raw gem elements applied for particular reasons. The colors on people's outfits, their gowns, everything that you see, every color has a specific meaning. You just gotta know when it was made, more, you know, the time and the, and the people involved. Like we talked about Botticelli. Um, Botticelli, okay. and most of his paintings are of Venus and Mars. Well, that's Lorenzo and his wife. And uh, we'll get to that one in a minute. So Plato was so different, Tim. How could it be, dude? What could be so different? Well, Plato, to him, was a fantastic historian. He was an interpreter. He was, uh, he was really just the, you know, the, the best guy for explaining to you and I the story of a long line of master mathematicians, if you will. All right? Now, Marsilio Ficino being a priest, he did not believe in a Jesus Christ. He, he taught and wrote that in, for him... Jesus Christ is uh, Christos, Jove, uh, divine knowledge that is from the sun, the, the sun in the sky. Um, uh, Minerva, um, I don't know how many other words to come up with it. Naus. <laughs> um, he believed in older teachings um, and you know, rightfully so. For if you if you know the gentleman and and his his and his history, why uh, he would say such things, and I'll make a, a quick attempt to explain why. Marsilio Ficino, his original explanation of Plato was that he was explaining the line of people. Um, let's say. Let's say Pythagoras. Now, we know Pythagoras gives us Pythagoras theorem, but there's much more to it than just that. There's the boring mathematics to it. Uh, it's more of an understanding on how everything is in nature or that has been or will be. Uh, it's just a, a, another step to simplifying a grand understanding. Uh, Marsilio Ficino would have wrote, he would have just been one of the people um, trying to harmonize the frenzies because he, he, his literal word for, for um, the divine knowledge 
uh, our understanding of it would be a divine frenzy. That it's frenzy, it's, um, well, like a hundred years after him, it started being used, chaos. You know, things are chaos in nature, um, but nature has a way of organizing. And, and he and others were showing examples on how to apply this to your life, to get yourself in order. Uh, to duplicate what's done in nature, you know, as above, so below. This is what he was trying to say. Um, so his platonic explanation was we had Pythagoras as a, a master teacher, but, you know, we even know today that uh, Pythagorean and Euclidean math existed long before Pythagoras and Euclid. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I know of for sure examples I've seen with my own eyes that are a thousand BC on Egyptian papyrus. Um, and the great thing is Facino says the same thing, that it is older than, than you know. Uh, this is what everyone knew then. Uh, this is what was lost in his time. He was writing that this is what was lost. He's and, trying to create a revival of this lost ancient knowledge that very few have kept that flame alight Right, that you know, the Renaissance is—it's the rebirth, right? And and, uh, and and yeah, it's exactly what he was trying to do, uh, but but it wasn't his goal, you, you know. Um, it was more of his purpose between just very influential people. We might we should also add, you know, that if you take the ten greatest scholars of, of his time in that whole part of Europe, I mean, even going all the way to Nuremberg, they are directly influenced by him, if not uh, in first-hand accounts, uh, in a major, major way. Um, now, they opened, he, he opened the Alexandrian um, branch, that, the school in, in Florence. Yeah, uh, yeah, he, well, with, of course, the Neo funding from the, the Medici, yeah, he opened the, the uh, Platonic Academia, the Florentine Academia. Where they would learn more than just art. They would learn mathematics, science, music. They, they had to be well-rounded. And that, you know, that, that well, everything was a part of it. And, really, and, and, no, and you shouldn't have any more than any other. And it so. encompasses the, the term the Renaissance man, more or less. That's where we get it's, it. Exactly. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, he, when he spoke of Pythagoras... He was very clear uh, because of his frustration, because the, the <laughs> I don't want to put words in his mouth uh, or, 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 have, or have anyone think they're my words. Uh, but I'm going to say uh, he, he strongly felt that Pythagoras, uh, the, he was, his frustrations with the whole platonic explanation was he had to change uh, the character of his, of his story, such as Pythagoras was Moses in the the Bible of the modern time, and um, and this went right down the line. Now he would he was saying, you know, what we know today as everyone knows, Socrates taught Aristotle, Aristotle taught Alexander, but to Facino they weren't. Yeah, yeah, they were teachers, but this was this was a father-son lineage, and this went back to Pythagoras, back to Euclid, back to beginning. As Ficino would say, it goes from Alexander back to Zeus, um, as uh, Jesus to, to Noah. Um, Noah uh, was a, a mathematician as well, believe it or not, according to Marsilio Ficino, and a pretty darn good one. Pretty darn good one. Um, Ficino might even suggest that uh, the original arch uh, diagrams in order to produce an arch, a proper arch, which is a, a section of a circle, more or less, N Noah would have known this. And as we've talked about, Tim, Ficino's follower, Giordano Bruno, wrote the book on how Noah's ark was just that. And he gave it to the Pope himself, and the Pope accepted that book. That book's lost, but nonetheless, it's, it's well documented. The Pope accepted that book, uh, and he didn't just accept it as a gift. Uh, I mean, he took it, and Giordano was 
he ran for the hills, but <laughs> we'll get to that next week. Um, this is this is old knowledge, is what I want to get at. A lot of history was lost in the right in this time, and we all know. It. You all know it, listening at home. You all look at the Renaissance and you say, "What did these people know that was so beautiful? What did they understand? They must have had such a great appreciation for uh, appreciation of another and love. How could this be? You know, how did this time end?" Um, but let's forget, how could this also be immediately following the Dark Ages? And how is it that in the time of the Renaissance, no one knew there was a Renaissance? Because all of the people that were pr practicing these beautiful works of art and the people that invented modern day harmony, people that wrote the first plays, the people that wrote the first operas, people that wrote the first books on, on all science that we know today, well, all of these people were doing it in fear of their lives. And just as, you know, all the truth is coming back. You know, that beautiful work that was done by Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel? Well, guess what, folks? That story you were told that he did it out of the glory of his heart for 20 years? Well, that's all come down. He did it because that was, uh, that was his sentence. He got caught doing something wrong. And uh, he got caught faking a, in a sculpture. He carved a sculpture, buried it in the ground for a year, faked it as being an antiquity from ancient Rome. It ended up being sold to uh, a cardinal at the Vatican, and, the, and he was really pissed off. Michelangelo went to Rome, and he said, sentence, paint the ceiling. He said, hey, I'm not a painter. And he said, hey, take your time. He said, this will take me uh, 20 years. And he said, you're a young man. Go at it. So, Tim, you know it. He almost went blind, no? You were there. Well, he... Uh and this is a well-known story that he he more or less became he, he was almost 100 percent blind but not 100 percent blind because of the paint stripping into his eyes and you know the, the materials that they would use to make the paints in many cases were toxic 80,000 square feet and i and might have said what an amazing job for a non-painter <laughs> incredible <laughs> incredible but hey you know why he's perfect because he applied everything he learned all the math worked, all the proper elements. But, hey, no New Testament figures. Hmm. Curious. So, back to Ficino. Uh, so, Ficino wrote that uh, these, this lineage, this lineage that was uh, being taught in Rome of the Bible, of Jesus going back and forth, that um, Jesus was, uh, to, to their side of the story, was Alexander, Alexander the Great. He lived the same amount of years. Um, from a line descended right from Zeus. But, you know, th there's a lot of different uh, variations. Uh, the, the Bible was changed several times. St. Augustine uh, did a lot of changes. Um, St. Jerome did major changes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was, you know, uh, three, five hundred years after Plato. But, uh, you know, to, to focus on the Eastern Roman Empire... When he, when he would, when Ficino would speak on something related to God, he would say the divine Christopher uh, in, in place of Christos, uh, the, the Minerva. Uh, to them, the divine Christopher, uh, it, they had an image of the divine Christopher, and we would call that Jesus in Roman uh, Empire. I say we because I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, but again... As I've said before, in 1,500 years and tens of thousands of works of art, you will not find Jesus nailed to a cross in any work of art in any manner whatsoever in the Eastern Roman Empire. That is strictly a Roman story. Um, that was the, the, the big meeting, Tim, in Florence in the 1430s and when Ficino was born, um, of the, the, the rulers and the Magi, as they were known from the Eastern Roman Empire, came to Florence and had a meeting with the Medici, and they were trying to figure out if there was any way of working out the Eastern Roman, the Eastern and Western uh, em Roman Empire beliefs, because it would be too bad to lose everything uh, over a silly egotistical uh, land battle, because they, they knew the, the church was trying to take Constantinople uh, over the donation of Constantine, the, this document that um, says Constantine, you know, gave 
all the land and everything that was Constantinople's to, to the Roman Empire. And um, they knew it. They knew it uh, then, and they knew it in Ficino's time uh, that that document was a forgery that was probably made in the time of Charlemagne, and actually the Vatican does acknowledge that probably is the case as well today. Uh, but Ficino was one of the people that standing strong arguing that document at that time, just to let that be known. He, because he was a scholar of the translation, it was a, the document was containing words that did not exist in the time of Constantine. And it, it obviously took certain scholars to be able to prove such a thing. Um, just to uh, go off the topic for a sentence, Tim, uh, the donation of Constantine, this forgery of a document I'm referring to, this would be the root of all four of the Crusades. So all four of the Crusades took place because of this document. And if you do not know at home, folks, all four times the Crusades took place at Constantinople, which at that time, Constantinople was known as the New Jerusalem. So did the Crusades go to Jerusalem and find knowledge? Yeah, they probably did because they went to Constantinople. And if you look into it at home, folks, that is the case. And, yeah, they did come back with knowledge. We talked about this before, Tim, even with uh, Master Mason, Robert Sullivan. Uh, this would be the time when now in the Western Roman Empire we're starting to come out of what was then the Dark Ages. Giant cathedrals were built with massive arches. All glorious uh, cathedrals were built at any height you wanted as long as you followed the math correctly. But, yeah, they found wisdom. Did they find what was buried under Solomon's temple? Well, probably not. Um, they were not where Solomon's temple was. It's, uh, it's an allegory. It's uh, Solomon's temple, if you look at the design, to Ficino and the rest of them, they would say it's, if you look at it, and it's quite true, if you look at them, what they designed it as today, it's, it's nothing but a golden rectangle. And uh, it all heads down to a smaller rectangle and a smaller and a smaller and a smaller, right until you get to the center chamber where the knowledge was kept. It's quite interesting. So they explain how it pertains to your life. Now, with Ficino explaining the divine line of these guys, is he's trying to say that there was a divine teaching and an understanding and an appreciation that is long gone, that's been lost, and the whole purpose was that everyone was to seek out love. And you say, that's, that's great, you know, I seek love too. I love my wife, I love my husband. You know, do you, do you know what love is? What is love? What is, is love what makes you really happy? Um, Tim, what, what makes something good? I would say, um, well, hmm. demand. What makes something right? Demand? Yeah, well, I mean, that's not what makes something good, but... Uh, is something good? Something is good when somebody wants it, and, you know, like, uh, it becomes good. I mean, I mean, it depends on where you're really going. What do you mean by something? Well, that's you, the thing. I mean, well, that's, that's just what I mean. What, what is good? I mean, to the average person, what is good to them is uh, a fulfillment of what they desire. Uh, it's what they like. It's what they want. But what is a want? Um, to Ficino, this would have been, and he would have been saying this from Pl Plato's teaching, he would have been saying, you, you ha now this you have to start to self-examine yourself because these things you like, these things you want, you seek, and you desire, every one of them is temporary. And, and what are you trading for that? How hard are you working for this? That, that can be, it can be taken away from you. you. It will eventually not be as great as it is when you initially desire it. When you achieve it and you do possess what you so desire, you're just going to desire something else that you want, and you're going to go through this endless cycle of desiring. You're going to end endlessly desire and try to obtain and possess it. And, and what is the purpose of that? What are you fulfilling? It's an endless cycle. And you might say, well, it's good, it's good to me. 
you you know you might want to um as he would say you would be ignorant um to the self-examination because for you not even looking at it for you to say well i like it and and that's all i have to say about it uh, you you would be ignoring probably many different things uh, it's what the them. Buddhists would say, what they would call selfish cravings, more or less. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, hey, Socrates, right? Um, you know, goodness is um, learning all the all the beautiful treasures the world has to offer, but to desire none of them, right? Um, and it, it all boils down to when you see something you like and you say, "Oh, that's really nice. Uh, I really like that." Um, why do you, you know, what, why is the, the uh, first reaction of the average person say, oh, I like that. I have to have it. Why do you have to possess it? Why do you have to own it? Um, Man, did we have this argument about uh, four or five months ago? Do you remember that, Joe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but th this is what he's going through. And, and to what extent? And, but, you know, he was applying it to, to his church fathers at this point. These were in, in his letters to his superiors, because at his time, it was well encouraged for cardinals and, and the like to be successful. So it was, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, the cardinals um, were, you know, kind of, uh, you know, getting quite the benefit from a lot of the local businessmen. You know, there was a... Sure. A little bit of pressure that was put on a lot of them, because a great deal of the Inquisition, and um, it, it was a very sketchy time for someone to have such beliefs. But you know, he was writing this to two people that I know of that were, uh, you know, world rulers of the time. That if I were to grab ten of the leaders of the the known world at that time. These would be the two guys, historically, in my research, that have only intentions to preserve what they feel is good. And to them, what is good is divine wisdom. Uh, to, to learn, to them, what is all good is to learn what goodness actually is. And to them, goodness was divine. And by that, I mean, it is implanted in you it is it comes from the, the center of the sun it comes to them the sun itself uh, puts in thought uh, ideals imagination and most importantly uh, to Ficino for the three hours pre-dawn uh, would be um, impressing many important uh, dreams. This would be a very important time for the sun to, uh, to for them, the sun to really impress uh, insightful dreams. So for them, it was very important for the three hours before sunrise. Uh, it was awesome. You know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty e easy to understand why they, they, I mean, let's, let's just say it, they, you know, they were more or less worshiping the sun in one way, form, or another. There was a divinity that the sun presented because of the, the, the way that the sun can um, shine rays through objects and down to earth. And right, it, the sun it brings life, penetrates it brings, everything. Right. right, it brings warmth, it brings a good feeling. And so, you know, I mean, it's pretty simple to, to understand why. And it's not like, let's just say that uh, you go from one corner of the earth to the, to the, to the other, and there's so many cultures obviously that worship the sun yeah well they they understood i mean it, it all comes down to uh down to the basics you know breaking mm -hmm. it down uh like like plato did with the the platonic shapes you know everything is and broken the, the down to five is, geometric shapes yeah uh, you know at the time i mean whether it was said or not but a lot of his ideals were of pagan um very much know, so yeah origin. well which is greek and he was a and they were Greek. Well, just so everyone knows, in Constantinople, right till the very last day in 1453, they spoke Greek. Uh, and just so you also know, uh, they would King Matthias. When people wrote to King Matthias, they write to him, say, King Matthias, uh, King Matthias of Hungary. And unfortunately, I have to write of Hungary because 
Athens is gone. Uh, because on the Greek end, they would have referred to it as Athens. Um, but they were, they were, there were many pagan beliefs. There were many, but again, there, there were many different beliefs in Constantinople, but, but they also understood each other in the sense that they knew that's just their way of understanding the very same thing. You know, um, when Constantinople was founded in this area, you have the Pythagoreans already, the uh, the Platonists. You have uh, Zoroaster and all of his followers, but they were they were all kind of they all kind of coexisted because it was really just a different teaching for your people. You know, they they understood it was all or originating from the same idea. You know, there was no oppression of any idea. There was no force to learn anything. It was more of how do you not understand this yet? Let me show you, please, you know. We'll be right back, folks. And uh, we'll really get into it next with uh, maybe a little Herbie's Trismegistus. favorite host? Well, imagine if you will have an all the broadcast shows from 2013 to listen to anytime you want. Awesome deal, huh? Anyway, so stop by freedomslips.com and order the entire 2013 library of your favorite host for just $30. Not only do you help with the station funding to keep us on the air, you also help the host because they get half of the net on every order. Also, we have Revolution Radio's all-time favorite shows all on one disc. The details are really broad, so you'll have to visit the website and go look at the details yourself. It's Again, www.freedomslips.com forward slash season2013.htm and get your favorites. First come, first serve, 7 to 21 days for delivery. Thank you. This is Revolution Radio Freedomslips.com, where information ever sleeps. Including me. <laughs> Later. We've got to stop them. They're going to kill us all. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Join us here on Revolution Radio, Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern on Studio B. For a politician, patriot, social savant, businessman, former investment banker, and Veterans Today columnist, Mike Harris. Listen to Mike as he exposes the corruption, sedition, and terrorism within our own government. He knows our system is flawed and that obstruction of justice is all too commonplace. His show, Short End of the Stick, pokes at this corruption with eloquent style. That's Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Studio B, for the Short End of the Stick, with the man who should have been elected governor of Arizona, Mike Harris. That's right here on Revolution Radio. Samsung, your host of the Samsung Report. Join me for Wild Bill's Headline Roundup every Saturday night, right here on Revolution Radio. 
Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. If you plan to call in and speak with one of our hosts, please turn down your radio and separate yourself from any background noise and wait for the area code to be called on before you speak. And don't forget, Revolution Radio freedomslips.com is listener supported. So stop by the homepage, freedomslips.com, visit the site support area to help support the host you're listening to's airtime. Thank you. Revolution Radio freedomslips.com, where the truth never sleeps. Revolution Radio. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to Researchers Radio Live. I'm Joe Kiernan. That's Tim C. This is freedomslips.com. Uh, before we get going, folks, I would like to tell everyone how grateful I am to be broadcasting from freedomslips.com. And we would like to continue doing this, and I would like to try to reach more people. Uh, there is a lot more we can do to help out. Uh, everyone at home, it's time you consider a little donation to the station you listen to and love. And uh, remember, we do not we do not have uh, membership fees. We do not have a, a monthly subscription for you to listen. Uh, you could tune into Studio A or Studio B. There's typically 24 hours a day. You're going to catch a live broadcast on Studio A or B. Uh, that's you're really not going to find that anywhere else. This is commercial free, and we ask for donations so we can continue to provide it that way. Or else Tim C. is going to have to start doing Depends ads and contraceptive ads, and he <laughs> won't stand for that. I know he won't, but we don't want to see it get there, Tim. That's what I'm yeah, getting at. I, I can't do contraceptive ads because uh, I got fixed a couple years back. I didn't even know you were broken, brother. <laughs> well, we could donate for that as well, but we're happy to hear your fix now. Yeah, I'm, I'm really broken and out fixed. That's fantastic, Tim. Things just keep going forward, right? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, everyone, just get over to the station and make a donation, please. You know, I mean, uh, or either that, or just, I'm just gonna have to give you the silent treatment for a minute or two, and uh, that's not gonna work. Listen, you don't even have to do that. You could uh, do a, a monthly subscription to the archives, which you should be doing anyway because there are buttloads of awesome shows, and that's a fact. I'm not even trying to pitch that to you. It's a technical term. Come on, man. You know, you people got to – you really got to get out there. Yes, the internet is free, but unfortunately, as ironic as it is, if you don't pay for it, it's not going to stay that way. Go figure, but I wouldn't have thunk it myself. So, Tim – we got into Pacino a little bit, a little platonic understanding of what he was trying to say. Uh, I'm hope, I hope I'm giving him a fair shot uh, to everyone at home. I'm not a teacher of any of this stuff. I'm just going to try to tell you what the guy's saying because he influenced a lot of uh, influential people, which is not easy to do. Right. Especially at that time. Uh, he, See, what 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 Joe's trying to say is, that, like, like he mentioned earlier about going to the horse's mouth. That's something that we've discussed for decades, me and myself and Joe. That you know, where's the source of of the truth? You know, where's the source of the the learned uh, the, the teachings of all all the scholars and and uh, philosophies? You go back to the source, and you get a much more pure example. Right, and that—that's pretty much what me and Joe have been doing over the past. Well, I could say probably twenty, well, fifteen to twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with with looking into this and, topic, in and particular. even with Hermes Trismegistus. 
with Hermes Trismegistus. With the, with the Kabbalion we went through 15 years ago and the Corpus Hermeticum and, mm -hmm. and all of this. And here we go, folks. Back to um, Marsilio Ficino. If you've heard of Hermes Trismegistus, if you've read any of the books pertaining to the works of the body of being the Corpus Hermeticum or the Kabbalion or, or any of the, the Emerald Tablets, any of these, you could also thank Marsilio Ficino because you could only trace it back as far as him. Beyond him, there are fragments because we know they were around. We know the teachings are old. Uh, Ficino tells you quite clearly he's not, it's not, he didn't invent it. Uh, he's translating it. He's translating it to Latin, just like why did he give us Plato? He gave it to us in Latin. Uh, some Greek text he had, yes, but the rest, again, he was a master teacher on memory. Um, some people can claim to have been able to perfect the nine muses, and you know what? Uh, they claimed a, um, a, uh, a whole new ascension there, which I, I can't even get into in this show, uh, but it pertains to the story of Jacob's Ladder, um, just uh, another argument of his on something that was taken and out of context and reused in the Bible. Um, same with Socrates being King David. I don't even know if I left that major one out. Uh, Marsilio had to remove. There were things King David did in the Bible that Marsilio had to take away from Plato. Uh, where What I mean is to Marsilio Ficino, that these were things that Socrates did. Um, so it, I'm not asking you at home to believe Ficino's writings. I'm just letting everyone know there were different explanations of things. So what you're saying, not to interrupt you, well, I did oh. interrupt you, but what, what you're saying is the, the text that Ficino was basically translating of Plato's Basically, we're stating that uh, a lot of the a lot of the figures in the written in the Bible were in actuality um, Greek heroes and legends. Right, right, right. Um, that, well, to to him, that was the Bible story. That was the characters' names in the Bible. But he didn't. He would not have been teaching a Catholic Bible. You know, there was different teachings in Eastern Roman Empire. Did they believe in Christianity? Yes. Did they believe Jesus died on a cross? No way. Not one person in Constantinople would have would have told you that. Uh, they, actually, then they probably would have said, uh, "Give me proof of that," because that didn't happen. Uh, well, I'm sure a lot of our listeners would. But they were just uh, different from the Western Roman Empire. That's that they were just co completely different in Christianity. So that's basically what it is. It's just a matter of it's a culture. Well, it's let's let's phenomenon. Oh, well, let's step a, back. Let's step back for a moment, if we can. It's probably even better for people at home. Uh, Constantinople, how it was founded. Everyone says the Council of Nicaea changed everything. The Council of Nicaea did change a lot. Okay, now what people are accusing Constantine of changing in Christianity, these these major changes of the the Christian story really started to change. Tim, you and I have been through this research. Uh, we started to really change uh, just around the year 300, just a little bit before, actually, with St. Jerome, who's known as St. Jerome today. A lot of the things people accuse Constantine of changing, St. Jerome changed. And St. Jerome was about 100 years after Constantine. Now, Constantine didn't like the changes that were being done to Christianity by the figures of Rome that at this point were now invading Alexandria. So Constantine gathered what he could uh, in terms of uh, books, knowledge, scholars, teachers. Uh, actually, thousands of people went with him, uh, enough so that he moved to a whole new area far away from Alexandria, and he started Constantinople to continue teaching what he, what, what they were teaching Christianity was in Alexandria prior to the Roman invasion. Um, things really fell apart in Alexandria after him, but n nonetheless, uh, Constantinople was founded, and they, they differed from this. This was the creation 
of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. This is this is geographically when it became different because of the differences in the teachings. So the, their Christianity was, um, you know, the son of God was the sun uh, in the sky, but they had a figure that you would see as in a painting uh, to recognize who you might, uh, we might call Jesus. Uh, but this was just a, a figure uh, for your eyes for an easier understanding. Uh, it, it was, it, it was, it was a, a symbol of inspiration. Uh, it's easier to understand things when you see them sometimes, and they. It, it's also easier to understand things sometimes with the right music and the right harmony. Uh, this is also why temples and churches early on started with hymns and music and harmony. They knew. Uh, Orpheus writes. Darn near 2,000 years ago, he has an incredible book that's well appreciated today by scholars of all Orphic hymns. Uh, it, it's an incredible book, and and they're all all the Orphic hymns are songs to God in harmony. Uh, basically, they were saying, and Facino uh, the like that we had songs in particular harmony for reasons, just as uh, certain animals have cries and songs to the sun birds sing certain songs when the sun is out when they don't sing when the sun's not out uh roosters crow their song every morning right uh to hermes trismegistus with the rooster as vicino teaches you uh the, the rooster is not only important because he acknowledges the the rising sun but because before he sings his morning song every time he must flap his wings three times uh this comes to the the whole trice factor we'll get to trice momentarily i believe um so you know tim far-fetched no not really uh teachings are understandable in regards to we have to remember there's a large gap of understanding lost he was merely trying to cover that gap if you will I hope I'm not uh, straying too far. That's but, okay, uh, Joe. But we do every show. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I didn't want to get too far because we we were starting to talk about how we began researching things to their, their earliest. As with Hermes Trismegistus, we went through the Kabbalion and many of the other teachings, and, and we went back to Ficino. And now... You had yourself a good set of the, the hermetic teachings yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you have an early copy of those? Uh, no, I didn't have an early copy. No? Definitely, Did definitely not. I, I mean, I had a Greek copy that was translated, but I don't know how early it technically was. Um, yeah. I'll forgive you, Tim. That's all right. You know, I mean, you get what you can get. Amazon, right? <laughs> Amazon. Actually, I like Amazon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I sure do. I got that in the the probably the the one you're talking about. Maybe uh, I'm thinking. I thought you had a, a late 1800s. Set. No, I I had purchased um, several books from a few uh, used bookstores down in Nyack, New York, and I found a couple gems in the city. But uh, my Corpus Hermeticum came from Amazon. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Well, fantastic. I did. Per I did get a another book this week. What'd you get? Um, Luca Pacioli's Divine Proportions. A copy of the. It's a literal. I thought I told you. Um, a complete facsimile of the original copy, in a bound. It's pretty nice, and it has. Phew, my goodness. Uh, maybe. 200 different geometrical shapes drawn in it all by Leonardo da Vinci. It's absolutely incredible. It goes the through. The funniest thing about you is that when you talk about getting a new book or a new text of any sort, you never, the first thing I think of is how long is it? But you never do that because to you, it's, it's a joy. To me, I have to fit it into my schedule. So. 
and I, and I never have the time to sit down and just read like you do. I, I, I don't know how you, you fit it in. We've talked about this in the show before, but, you know, my hat's off to you. Well, you know, some people never miss a TV show. You know, um, listen, it, if, you, if you want something bad enough, you find time for it. It's what it boils down to. Whereas I want to read a book, right? I'm going to find time through my day to read that book, even if it's 10 minutes at a time. Um, I will find the time to do it. If I am picking my kids up from school and I have to sit there for 10 minutes, I, you guarantee it I'm reading a book sitting there. Uh, I'll, yeah. I mean, uh, you f I find time, you know, I, if I want to read that book, I'm going to read that book. And, um, if I really want to read it, like I need to read it immediately, I might cancel a, a lot of things to make that happen, depending how bad, how, how important it is to me at that moment. So if it's necessary for like something I'm working on. So how long research is Research wise. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, how, no, how many pages, Joe? With the divine proportions. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I, eight hundred. Yeah, I'm gonna guess. See, I cringe. That's that's insanity right there. At least there's pictures. There's a lot of pictures, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all in Latin. Awesome. But beautiful pictures. Beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's it's a it's a it's an absolute masterpiece. I mean, the thing was lost for four hundred and something years. They didn't even know it existed. It was just kept uh, just basically in one family's library. It's in one family's collection for four centuries. Absolutely incredible work of art. And a fantastic book at the same time. It, it, I mean, it really goes through all of the math we were just discussing and how it's relative to everything. I mean, it has all Leonardo's drawings on. This is where we would find Leonardo's drawings on the proportion of the human body and the face and how um, the the... The two, you know, uh, the corners of your mouth are the center of each of your pupils and, and your nose is to the edge of your eye and wh whatever it is. And um, he breaks down literally everything, like um, from your, your chin to the top to the, the bottom of your lower lip is one eighth of your face or something. I, I hate to even say it because I'll mess it all up, but he literally goes through uh, every nook and cranny of your body, you wouldn't even imagine. But he explains how uh, every part of it follows the same math that you'll find in every plant and every tree and every animal. And it's, it's all the same math. And uh, to them, it was the same math in their teachings uh, of what Pythagoras, of Euclid, of Socrates, of uh, uh, everyone. And, you know, to them, Alexander the Great... Um, to them, to Ficino, he said Alexander was successful in every battle because there was no battle. He didn't, he wasn't a conqueror. He was being, he was, you, he was, to them, he was uniting the world. Do you, you know, um, everyone was coming to an understanding, uh, like, hey, n no more need to fight here, you know? Just, um, we all understand the same thing, all right? Cool. History, you know? history says a different story. Uh, that, that was, you know, we say today he conquered the known world at the time. But, you know, the reason why, you know, he didn't lose men was that they really weren't fighting. They weren't trying to conquer anybody. And uh, that was why he was so revered by every nation, uh, even still today. Um, you can look into it, folks. Uh, pretty much uh, all the major European ruling families and all like will have great appreciation for that story because um, it, it's well known to a lot of people that's uh, an old story so there's a lot of people that know it um, I don't even know how else to say it. I, I don't want to uh, take anyone's. Um, I don't want to. It's a fine line, Tim. You know, with, with the the religious story. All, for me, only because it's it's so controversial. You know, um, for people, people religion that's supposed to be for such a such a, the process of an understanding 
Um, that's where I get the most resistance. And, and I and I say this, we're not in a, um, a belittling way, but that's where I met with the most ignorance in the sense that uh, most religious people that I speak to on a historical level won't hear anything that strays from a particular belief. I, even I even if I could show it five ways. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, I, am I seeing something about St. Jerome? Are you writing saying something about St. Jerome? Oh, that was like 10 minutes ago. Oh. Someone, we, we, were, we were talking about St. Jerome earlier, and um, someone in the chat room asked if we were talking about St. Germain. I said, oh, that's probably a good topic for another show. Yeah, that is a great idea for another show because uh, – St. Germain would be coming out of this area too. At uh, relatively. That was Herbal Floozy. Herbal Floozy. Oh, hello, Mona. Yes. So, Tim. Joe. Hermes Trismegistus, the Trice Great. Yeah. So, Ficino and history will say that Ficino, well, the history will say that the Hermetic texts were found in Macedonia around uh, the, the 1450s or somewhere around there. Mm. And they were brought to Florence and to, to be translated. Whether or not that's accurate, uh, if you want to take a stab at that, that's fine. If not, we'll just... Well, it, in, well, you know, I could take it two ways. No, not at all, because we know his... Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici purchased those books, the, the Corpus Hermeticum, from a bookseller in Venice, uh, and Ficino translated them. So whether some were found in Macedonia in the 1450s, maybe, but that's not the one Ficino was working with. However, uh, Macedonia, ironically, uh, that would have been where King Matthias was in the 1450s. That, that would be that region. So if, the, some, if some appeared in the 1450s in that area... Yeah, it's very likely because that would be King Matthias. It's very possible. So more or less what happened is uh, they were brought to Florence and uh, – Well, with the, corpus, with, with the Corpus Hermeticum for Hermes, when, when the Medici acquired those Greek texts, they uh, – and these letters exist. They asked uh, Marsilio. They said, we know your – translating uh, the complete life works of Plato. Right. And, and we're, you know, and we're dying for every next word here, but stop everything and please translate the complete body of work of Hermes Trismegistus. And it was a, yeah, absolutely. I'll get right on this thing. And, you know, a great find, you know, it was one of those letters. Well done. Uh, and, and, and he did. And uh, the, the, the original works from Marsilio, he would have been telling you that, uh, for, first of all, Tim, we, we spoke about this earlier. He, was, he did not say Hermes Trismegistus. He said Mercurius Trismegistus right. is Mercury. Uh, the same guy, I mean, he did say Hermes too, but um, just in reference of where if, if he said Hermes, it was usually a, a one name. Maybe that was his, uh, his, street, his street term for him, you know. Uh, but and Hermes was quite the character from history because he's attributed to three different lifetimes. Right. Um, 300 and, years in a flash he lived. But, right, right. And but, but now Ficino was saying that, you know, he, um, yeah, he lived 300 years, but he was saying he lived three 100 years more or less consecutively do you you, you feel me there he well, was I understand saying what you're lived saying, he was still saying he, he only lived 100 years i don't know for sure if but i perfected buy that three ways well they, I, that's what he me, was saying part of me over the years has has entertained the idea that maybe he really was just because of his well, we'll just say secular beliefs, even though he was a well, priest. Well, see, there were many teachings that came from it. But to Ficino, what he was saying, and, and he was saying, and he'll even say, if you read, when he, when he says this is what was taught in Egypt, he'll give you specific examples. 
Um, right. And he and he's very thorough with all of that. Well, and there's even there's even text where it attributes uh, Hermes Trismegistus as a contemporary of, I believe, Abraham. Yeah. 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 But now what what he was saying was Hermes mastered the what we would call today the the Mister the secret of the number three or the three. He would just find how uh, I was saying with the rooster flap swing. He would go through everything that got broken down to the number three. Again, they would take everything and simplify it to its simplest form and get it in order. And it was just another example of that. But Hermes was the one to Ficino who took nature and taught us how to mimic it to what the stars, because they felt gemstones and, and uh, plants and, and certain things like that had influences from, from the stars from planets and uh, and they had good reason for thinking it. Uh, it's the uh, same astrology we have today, but a, a little a little more intricate, uh, a little more specific, if you will, because because the, because so much was on it. It wasn't just your your astrology. It would be what stone you're going to wear on your ring today, because uh, they might say, you know, uh, today. Uh, you need this particular stone, and you wear that uh, under a gold band, and you put this particular leaf between that stone and the gold, and don't let it touch your finger, and 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 make something of this drink today, of this and that and this. And Hermes was the one to Ficino that was teaching us how to take everything that was made for us and use it in the right way to uh, mimic it, as the this you know what what has been given to us from above, whether the sun, the moon, the stars, and and uh, and Hermes was that uh, that medium, teaching us how to uh, mimic what's above, um, within, you know, and uh, to Chino, Hermes was his books of Hermes was trying to explain as above so below, meaning all of the divine impressions put down here on earth it's how to recognize them and how to use them in the proper way to give back and uh they had many different plants that were used for different times uh that which have to be specific many different plants to be used uh, to be ground and mixed at particular times with particular things there was uh, there was many different variations. The the constellations and the positioning of the planets was very very important. It was huge to them. I, you know uh, what, what impressed about, me? This was the books of life he wrote. That was very very difficult for him. This was the ones that almost got him killed from the Inquisition. The first time I read the Kabbalion, which more or less is really an introduction to to the Hermetic texts, um, I what impressed me was. Number one, like the principle of vibration, that really is like a description of how the atom works. And, how, and, and I thought to myself, wow, that's pretty profound that uh, this knowledge was, was attained over 2,000 years ago or close to 2,000 years ago. Because the truth is, the, the texts themselves, there's so much, um, there's arguments as to when they were actually written. The second and third centuries, probably the... Uh, uh, the academic agreement as to when they were actually written, but we all, you know, I, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people do believe that they, they, the ideas were taken from earlier texts. Oh, of course it was. Of course, of course, um, of course, it was taught in Egypt long, long earlier. Um, excuse me, far earlier than the oldest text we have recovered. Um, but we know that through symbols and paintings in Egypt. Um, we have a lot of their texts that are just very simple, a different name, right? Thoth. Uh, but this, same teachings, same teachings. Uh, th but this is, again, why he was attributed to so many places at the same time. Uh, this was... Some even say that he's, uh, he, he was known to the Mayans as Quetzalcoatl as well. It's... It, I mean, there's so many different I mean, stories. Right, right. Um, again, this comes back to a common unity understanding. And that was the whole purpose, though. That was the whole purpose, was 
simplifying everything, that it's just understandable, that everything becomes recognizable, that when you attained the understanding of how to mimic what is given from above, it, it, it hits you like a brick that you will never forget it. And that's why they would use things as examples to possessions. Why do you struggle so hard for something that could be taken away so easily? Where you know what? I, I, I want something truly. It'll never be taken from you. I want to say something since you just said that. Okay. Um, there was one thing that, that always got me about that, that I always, I always struggled with. Um, and I think a lot of it is the translation. I think that there's an issue with a misinterpretation from the original texts. Because as you know, you know, a lot of words get misinterpreted and twisted. And people, people use them for their own purpose or, or uh, you know, uh, more or less their, their own agenda. But the idea that man could find, you know, not only God inside him, you know, in himself, but he could also become some type of God. And that, that is an interpretation that the Catholic Church really had a problem with. And that, that was the, one of the most defining moments, you know, what we'll just say defining pieces that they had a problem with. But what I, I always believed myself after reading, you know, reading into this for years and years, that, you know, more or less, it's not a matter of becoming a god. It's more like you... It was, an, it was just a... An example of perfecting everything on Earth. Well, that, that's my point, is that if, if you, you know, if, if you, you find, I mean, listen, you know, you're, you this know yourself. This is the symbol of, this was why Ficino called them the divine Christopher, and they had an image of it in the Eastern Roman Empire. This well, is also the pharaoh in Egypt. He didn't really think he was the son of God. He was God's representation, if you will, in the sense of everything that's created mimicking to the what we what Ficino was teaching through the Greeks, the nine arts of the muses, if you could perfect those nine, that those are the nine from above. You perfect them, then you get to number ten, being the grand creator. And it, it touches on the idea touches on um, Eastern philosophy, where you you know if you know if you know your true self, if you if you attain some form of enlightenment or a certain level of enlightenment, then you are closer to, to the divine, to what is you know the source, or um, you have an understanding more of closer to God than of mortal understanding, and and um, that that to me is what what I took from the hermetic writings as far as, you know, because it, it like I said, it's misinterpreted in, in a lot of different places that you find it, that, oh, you're going to be godlike, you're going to be a god, this and that. And, you know, and I just, I, I always, I always felt that that was misinterpreted. Well, same thing with, with saying, and even, even you just said earlier that they worship the sun. I beg to differ. I cannot find anyone who would have said anything like that at hmm. that time. They appreciated all of the wonderful things that gave to us, like they recognized every animal that followed the sun in the sense, let's say the crocodile, they, you know, they knew its purpose. And, and this was just an example of it. It always has to face the sun all day. And they just knew what each animal did. And they knew what animals were affected by the moon. And uh, they had an appreciation of all of these things. Like, why is it every full moon all shellfish open up? Why is it that on a new moon, elephants have to find running water and shower water up to the moon that's not there? Uh, they say they, they would have done this as, a, as an offering, a sacrifice, uh, an appreciation, you know, asking for the moon. In the same respect, they say this is why the uh, elephants, when, when dying, will roll around and toss flowers up into the air as, as an offering. Um, or why an elephant, knowing its great size, wouldn't dare hurt anything. And why it, it seems, when it, when it, uh, to Ficino, when an elephant came across someone who was uh, of a good understanding of himself, an elephant would know to bow, which, hey, that might have been true. We know they bow, but to what extent, I don't know. If, if they bow to well-knowledged people, I sure wouldn't know. Um, but, you know, they had an understanding of all of this, the numbers of it. Um, you know, they, Ficino said very clearly that in their understanding was uh, angels were 
existed. Yeah, absolutely. He felt there was, and he felt there was a way to communicate with them. And this was Jacob's ladder to be able to go up and down per se, to uh, get info back and forth. Uh, this was information. He was saying that uh, no idea was created by you. No, no thought is originated within yourself. You are not the first person to think of that. Well, all of these things, they're not to you. Where does a good idea come from? Why do they use the symbology of a light bulb over your head? Because they claim, you know, there is divine knowledge coming into you. You are more often in your own way than not. And they were teaching through Hermes Trismegistus a way of acknowledging all the different influences that were put down upon Earth and you daily that you need to acknowledge and get in order to apply it to yourself and you'll live a long life. I mean, he wrote a book on it and Tim, we've talked about this. People didn't live a long time, but all of these dudes, they lived a long time. They lived a real long time. So uh, the texts say, definitely. Mm-hmm. But uh, hey, even Plato writes, uh, some Chino writes about Plato. This is why Socrates... Uh, died on his birthday 81 years, and he's specific about it. Nine, because it's nine times nine. 81. It's perfect. Uh, again, that's how many steps are on each side of the pyramid in Mexico, in Chichen Itza. Uh, 81's a huge math number. So is nine. They all know it. I know it. People know it today. And you know what? Back to it again. Every ancient civilization knew it. They built their math to it. They built every structure to it. Um, we don't use it today that much, but um, it's kind of forgotten because people think they're just boring math formulas. However, how much it applies to everything you see in your daily life, it would take me weeks upon weeks to give you daily examples, which I could do endlessly. Uh, Tim, we've been through this on their comparison of all the animals. Mm -hmm. um, they knew them. They knew animals and plants more than you could possibly imagine uh, in an incredible amount. Um, it's mind boggling because you, you could really look at the works put together on how much they understood. And, uh, you know, a lot of these ointments and uh, things, uh, medicines that uh, he writes to make in his book on life uh, for certain purposes, still the same crap today, man. Same stuff today. But uh, what's odd about it, Tim, is that's the stuff we would buy, like, uh, in um, in the natural aisle, like, buying, like, uh, like pure ginseng, you know, things like that, instead of, <laughs> like, buying painkillers, you know? Like, right. uh, they actually were giving... I think ginseng's used benefits. for something else there, buddy. Of course, you know what I mean. <laughs> that natural, you know, not all natural stuff, of course. He was, they were talking about the finest elements, and, and you know what? Again, back to the sun, he was adamant that these were the things that were going to be good for you to keep you healthy. Uh, this is, again, gold. The gold wasn't just uh, for luxury. Uh, they ingested it, and uh, not wildly through gold schlager. Uh, they actually, uh, again, had a process for it in a certain time. Uh, but uh, anything, again, following the sun, any heliotrope plant, such as sunflower, Sunflower follows the sun all day. It's golden in color. Fantastic seeds, many properties, fantastic oils. They knew it then, but not just the sunflower. All the heliotropic plants, they're all good for you. Any plant, any sun-following plant has fantastic properties. We still know it today. Uh, the animals that follow the sun, they're good animals, except for the one they felt strongly about uh was that crocodile man they didn't like yeah that i was just crocodile. gonna say al alligators and crocodiles i wouldn't consider good well they called <laughs> the crocodile the crocodile was a symbol as a, a hypocrite for them um because the crocodile when uh when it kills a man it'll it'll cry and weep about it for a while but then it will devour him ferociously well what about serpents they follow the sun thus the crocodile tears serpents follow the sun yeah they love the serpents it's an excellent uh, symbol of, uh, uh, I mean, the, the snake, uh, the serpents. Yes, they, they do. The, the only shapes they make are platonic geometric shapes. They, they only make shapes of the same math. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Like a snake can't make a shape that doesn't fit within the mathematical boundaries of sacred geometry. So there, the, a snake only makes shapes that nature makes. Like nature does not make 90 degree angles. So a snake doesn't make a 90 degree angle. You dig? Sure. Right. Um, I don't like, I don't, I'm not a big fan of snakes, as you know. I, uh, I, I, uh, I thought you liked snakes. No, um, I, I'm not afraid of snakes. Okay. But, but okay. I don't like them. Right, because I've seen you handle a few snakes. Yeah, no, I'm not afraid of them. I just don't particularly like them. Okay. Well, I happen to know that they also do not like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's uh but that's between you and them. Right. Yeah. We'll mm -hmm. work it out. Actually they probably like you a whole lot. Um but hey, my fellow Irishman. So where would the story be that uh oh I'll tell you one, ready? Marsilio Ficino was very upset about a few saints that were Eastern Roman Empire saints that the Roman, now the East, the Western Roman Empire consumed. Like, um, see, when Constantinople fell, a few changes were also made. This brought about the, the King James Bible and many others uh, right then. Um, a whole lot of change took place right then. Uh, there were a few saints that were taken, and um, St. Barbara... Was you know, Saint Barbara? They loved. She was the the saint of architecture and art and math. And uh, but Saint Patrick to them was a fantastic teacher and taught a lot of these things of Hermes, things like that. Uh, and they were really pissed off, Marsilio Ficino in particular, because this is when the story started coming out that Saint Patrick chased all the snakes out of Ireland, you know, and uh, a great deal of people from Constantinople were, were now in Ireland. So it's, they were pissed off because it's not only did we, we lose everything, but now you're, you're bastardizing our divine saints. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so they really only had a few saints, which the, I should mention the Western Roman empire did keep them. We still have them, but they just changed. They just changed a little bit. Uh, but to to them, they they really took offense of terms like the snakes were chased out of Ireland because, you know, that that was uh, directly relative to uh, non uh, non Catholics. Right. I mean, I want to say pagan, but all too often it that's taken somehow as a a, a terrible word um, when if you only understood the the true origins of it. Um, it really didn't have anything to do with, uh, with, uh, loose beliefs. Uh, the, these, these people in the early days, they liked to really understand things. They weren't forced to learn it. Um, they were merely giving examples of understanding, whether it be through books and teaching, music, art, poetry, acting uh, all of these it was it was do your best to perfect them all and you know what they were really encouraging about it this is where we also come from the term uh we also originate the term brotherly love not uh not any homoerotic uh comment it was merely uh you have a friend or uh, your neighbor whoever does something good tell him you did a good job encourage him because uh, you know he's working for goodness. He understands things the same thing as you. Uh, all too often, someone you know might be trying really hard for a personal desire of something they want, but that personal desire might influence might influence you, might somehow interrupt you. Say, you know, I know you really bad want to do this, but so often you, I have to give you rides places, and my God, you really want this thing, like. Is this thing where you're working so hard for, like, what is this really going to do for you? Tell me, please. And you say, oh, I just, you know, really want to buy this new TV, you know? And it's like, wow, man, like, cool, you know? You try, you strive so hard. Imagine to them, 
for Gino, he'd say, imagine you try that hard to look at yourself. He would even say over and over to people, imagine for a minute, if you're contemplating on, on who you might be, say, try to be the person you pretend to be. Because he said everyone at times has to pretend a little bit and wear a little bit of a mask and put on an act, whether you tell someone you're something or you have to act a certain way because you, you, you might want to be perceived that way. He's saying, imagine you put a little bit of effort to be that, to be that idea. Because you, you, to him, he's saying, you, you know enough to have an idea what is good to you, what, what your goal might be when you need it. However, you completely ignore it at all other times. And you most likely won't even want to talk about it if it's brought up to you. Because for whatever reason, you're protecting what you think is good. But when it comes to explaining what good is, one does not even want to talk about it. So he had an excellent way of explaining these sorts of things to these intellects of the time of ways I can never do. I would really encourage uh, people to uh, find a book of Marsilio Ficino's. Uh, I should, I really want to say it's very important for me to stress because I'm not a teacher of Marsilio Ficino. I am merely a student who truly appreciates the guy's teachings because when it comes down to it at the end of the day, forget about, in my opinion, if I could put aside wh whatever the differences are with religions, what it boils down to is his, his whole goal on writing and teaching was to do nothing but to teach somebody what real love was and how to attain it and how perfect it is when you attain it. And he'll give you so many examples of it and what goodness is. Uh, this is a guy who really had something special. And the genius minds of the Renaissance, they all really knew it. And this was probably the only reason why he was not killed by the Inquisition, was there was a tremendous respect for the man. Uh, but he was, he was walking on a fine line, and uh, he probably really didn't even leave Florence all that much. Uh, uh, it, it's funny, the, the tour guide story, as I always like to say, Tim, the the Wikipedia story or the, um, um, the three minute documentary on, on YouTube. But, um, I forgot what I was going to say, Tim. <laughs> it's okay. So, I was, uh, I, I was reading the chat room. There was me a too. Chatter going on. And, um, basically, um, Patrick, Anguish from the chat room was saying that he has no use for St. Patrick from what we were talking about earlier. And, uh, and Sindolo had mentioned that it's always the bastards. It's the bastards that always get the parades. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, I was reading that too. Hello, Sindolo and Patrick. Patrick, he, Patrick's a very knowledgeable guy, man. Many categories, especially right in this area. He knows the, he knows the Medici well. He knows uh, Lorenzo de' Medici. Um, Oh, with Ficino's books, people. Listen, go pick up his books. It's an incredible philosophy. If you really just want to read some awesome stuff on how someone – it really seems like the guy had a grasp on, on life. And quite interesting, he wrote a book on life. It's in three volumes. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, all of these works are from the 1400s. Book two, uh, the books of life is in three parts. It's three books on life. Uh, one's on how to attain a healthy life. One is how to live a long life. And uh, one is how to attain life from the heavens, including the sun. Uh, book two is, uh, my goodness, Tim, I think we talked about that. That is, uh, you and I, we, uh, hey, man. We know a few alchemical books, and I'm not talking someone writes a book on how to understand alchemy. I mean, I know some alchemy books. 
Um, he uh, he's he's got a, he's got a lot going on, man. You know, uh, thorough is thorough is an understatement. Um, yeah, he wrote. Several. I read it and I say, I don't. I still don't know enough. You know, I read it and I say, my God, like I really have to learn their astrology. I really do because it's to. And what's wild is, uh, see, for Chino, he split on the astrology. He he says astrology, its influence on everything and us is infinitely timeless. However, an astrologer's job is they will never run out of work. And it, it, he says it is a joke where he doesn't believe so much in the prophecy end of it, but he, he gives, I'm going to say at least 300 examples on how they influence your life daily, long-term and how they, and how they influence certain foods and drinks prepared at certain times to be ingested at certain times. Um, it, it's just, he gives great examples and he also gives great examples on where these things come from. Uh, and it, you know, it all wraps up with his third book, you know, how to live a long life. And, uh, it's quite interesting. It's, a, it's you know, a, you know, I saw a lot of similarities between, you know, the book on life and, and, uh, some of the readings I've done on Edgar Casey, cause he had a lot of remedies. Edgar Casey wrote of tons of different remedies for illnesses and sicknesses right. and, and whatnot. And it's so similar and it make, you know, it makes you wonder where, uh, because, Casey, you know, I mean, the story goes that he really, the only thing he really ever read was the Bible, like, right. he was uneducated and this and that, but, you know, it just makes you think. Hey, but you know Casey. Casey was able to slip into a universal knowledge field, whatever you want to call it. Right, he called it the Akashic Records. Oh, that's right. He did say Akashic Records. I forgot about that. Yeah, same thing. Same exact thing. I, I'm saying the same thing. I'm saying... I'll tell you, buddy, that's real deal. That's real deal, people. You could attain it. I promise you, man. Promise you. There and is a universal field of knowledge that you can attain. I promise you. Uh, again, back to it. No the thought originates Eastern within yourself. Religions speak more, speak on it as well in you know a different different ways, but they speak of it as like the source of your intellect and creativity and knowledge and. Um, you know, and they say that can be attained by uh, by means of meditation. And, well, absolutely. Uh, that, that comes down to inner, the, the question, uh, Eastern and these guys, what is the source of creativity? Mm. You know, that's another example they would use. What is goodness? Well, goodness, it's not goodness I, I would like to teach you. It's goodness in all things I desire, you know, uh, because it all exists. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's natural. It comes with, they're saying the goodness is the light of the sun. They right. are one of the same. Thank you. When you're getting your knowledge from the sun, you're this divine influence. It, it's, it's all in one. You're, uh, it is goodness. It's, that is Minerva. That is, that is Christos to them. That's, um, it's, it's all in one. It is, that is the physical image of God is the, the light of the sun, the sun of the sun, the image of the sun, what makes the sun the sun. Um, again, they say, you know, the, the creator above the sun created the sun and created the moon, which is his daughter, but also his sister, the sun's sister, uh, which sounds strange, but again, here we go in Egypt. Uh, this was the story of Isis and Osiris. Patrick English was just writing in the chat room that, uh, as we were talking about the Akashic Records, that it's an ancient Hindu Sanskrit term. Absolutely. And t we were just talking about the similarities with yeah, Sanskrit, we where I was show. talking about, uh, about uh, the Vatican. It was originally built on a sun, uh, for, for your term, on a sun-worshipping site that was already ancient, uh, coming from the Sanskrit word vatika. Uh, we we say Vatican, uh, but Vatica is what it was, and uh, 
that's Sanskrit. That's that's old, and it was sun worshiping. And I hate to break it to you, folks, but so's the obelisk right in the center square. Uh, that is an obelisk is a a ray of light. That is a ray of the sun, folks. And uh, believe it or not, a fantastic instrument for measurement. And um, hey, we talked about it, Tim. Using an obelisk in the sun, the, uh, they were able to figure out the circumference of the world because it was round right. in 400 BC uh, and probably earlier. But and and they and again in such an easy way, right? I mean, they explain it so easy. There's no shadow here, but there's a shadow there, and you use this stick and measure this and you Pythagorean math, right? Like a triangle, paste it out. There you go. And then you're able to figure out the distance to the moon, the size of the moon, likewise the sun. And you know what? Within 1% of accuracy, 2,000 years ago, they were able to tell the size of all the known planets and the moon, the distance to the sun. That's remarkable. And I have to use a calculator to balance my checkbook. But the world's flat. I know. Folks, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone at home. And to, we're very happy to have Tim C. back. Happy to be back. Thanks for listening, everyone.